Uh, my name is Nina Bose. I'm the Executive Dean for Public Policy and Public Service Program and the Director of the Peter S. Calico Center for the Study of the American Presidency in Hofstra's Peter S. Calico School of Government, Public Policy, and International Affairs. And it is truly my pleasure to invite you today to our Calico panel on predicting the 2024 presidential race question marks, <laughs> um, prospects, politics, and policies. We have two distinguished speakers here today, our Calico Senior Presidential Fellows, Ari Fleischer and Phil Shalera. I'm going to give more formal introductions in a moment. Um, I'll just take a quick couple of minutes to say some thank yous. Uh, we are delighted, absolutely delighted to have um, classes from political science, the Lawrence Herbert School of Communications, and writing studies here today. In particular, I want to thank Professor Burke for bringing her journalism News Write 11 class, News Writing and Reporting, um, my American Politics students, um, Dr. Burnett's American Politics students, um, Dr. Leslie Feldman's uh, American Political Thought students, and um, Professor X's, uh, Professor Dua Holly Sai Kao, um, radio students, and um, Professor Stewart's writing studies composition students. Thank you all, the faculty <coughs> and students, for being here today, as well as I know there are students in many other classes that are also joining us. Um, we are very fortunate to be able to host this event at the Hofstra University Club. And um, to have, this is uh, the programming that we have in the Calico Center and the Calico School has been so generously funded and, uh, and developed by Hofstra alum Peter S. Calico, class of 1965. Mr. Calico is not able to join us today, but I think, I know he'll be very happy to see this turnout and uh, this opportunity for informed civil discourse on the state of the presidential race and American politics. Let me thank President Susan Poser for joining us today, Provost Charlie Reardon, our Hofstra College of Liberal Arts and Sciences Dean, Eva Badowska. We have many colleagues here from the Calico School and the uh, Calico School Department, thank the Political Science Department Chair, Dr. Carolyn Dudek, and many of our colleagues who are in the audience today. We also are delighted to have two members of our uh, public policy, the Calico School's Interdisciplinary Public Policy and Public Service Program, External Advisory Council members, Mr. Chuck Catola and Mr. Michael Lucivera, here with us today. Thank you for joining us. Um, I also would like to thank the Hofstra Cultural Center, um, our wonderful media team that is recording this event for us, and I would be remiss if I did not give special thanks to the Hofstra University Club for seamlessly putting together a series of events from starting this morning to today, and it is, uh, to this uh, to this panel, and it is deeply appreciated. We have been bringing our two senior fellows to campus since the fall of 2021, and each time we have a discussion, I'm reminded how much we've talked about it and how little I know, uh, because I learned something new in each conversation, including both sessions this morning. So I'm looking forward to seeing what happens in our panel today. Um, I'll introduce our speaker from the order that they're next to me. Mr. Ari Fleischer is the head of Fleischer Communications, which is a uh, corporation, uh, communications and media strategy company working with communication media strategy company working with corporations and sports teams. Mr. Fleischer started his political career on Capitol Hill in the 1980s, where he worked for three members of the House and a member of the Senate. He then moved into presidential politics. He was communications director for Elizabeth Dole's presidential campaign in the 2000 election. After that, he joined the Bush-Cheney presidential campaign as spokesperson, where in that position, he was, uh, co 
responsible for the daily briefings, as some, many of you will remember, from November to December 2000 with the historic presidential recount. Mr. Fleischer went on to serve as White House Press Secretary in the first two years of the Bush White House. During that time, he gave daily briefings on such major world and domestic events as the September 11th terrorist attacks, two wars, Afghanistan and Iraq, and the anthrax attack. After leaving the White House, Mr. Fleischer published a memoir on his time as press secretary titled Taking Heat, which made it to number seven on the New York Times bestsellers list, and has uh, since worked in the private sector and continued to consult and advise widely in national um, um, politics. It is a pleasure to welcome you back, Clayari. Thank you for joining us. Mr. Phil Shalero started his political career on this very campus um, is as a graduate of the political science department class of 1978. As he was telling students earlier today and has told us before, he uh, participated in the political science department's trip to Washington, D.C. in the spring of 1977. And that led to an internship and a decision to go to law school and to work in Washington, where he is spent more than 25 years working on Capitol Hill, as well as several years working in the Obama White House. Mr. Shalero has more than three decades of experience in Congress and the executive branch. In, uh, on, in Congress, he served as Congressman Henry Waxman's chief of staff, also was Democratic staff director of the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee, in the Senate, were served as policy director for uh, that time Senate Minority Leader Tom Daschle, and was staff director for the Senate Democratic Leadership Committee. In the, at Capitol Hill, Mr. Shalero was deeply involved in health and environmental policies, including the 1990 Clean Air Act, and a number of high-profile investigations. In 2009, Mr. Shalero joined the Obama White House as director of legislative affairs, went on to serve as special advisor to the president, and then as advisor for the implementation of the Affordable Care Act in 2013, after overseeing, as President Obama's chief liaison to Congress, the passage of the Affordable Care Act in March of 2010, along with much other significant legislation during President Obama's first two years of office. Mr. Shalero today, is uh, the founder, a co-founder of two nonprofits, Co-Equal, an organization that serves as a bipartisan think tank in Washington to provide institutional memory to uh, public officials, and also Grow New Mexico, which is where he resides, an environmental nonprofit. Phil, it's a delight to welcome you back. Thank you both for joining us. Please join me in welcoming our speaker. Uh, some panel discussion. I have a few questions for the speakers. Actually, I have many, but I will um, try to limit them to about the first. Uh, I'll kind of keep it to four or five, and then we will open this up for um, audience Q and A. So let us begin. I think we can do. We can speak from here, though. You're either of you is welcome to come up here as well. The first question I wanted to ask both of you, and we've spoken about this, but we actually really haven't discussed this topic much today. Um, what is the state of the 2024 presidential race, the day after the third Republican primary debate, and just a few days after a, a poll from the New York Times and Siena College uh, that was released over the weekend showing Former President Donald Trump, the 45th president, leading the current president, Joe Biden, president, in five of six battleground states, Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, uh, Nevada, and Pennsylvania. And in the sixth state, Wisconsin, uh, President Biden lead, was leading this poll by about two percentage points. So we're just under a year from election day. Um, there is a lot to assess about public opinion and about the presidential candidates. I'll ask you both to begin with an assessment of where we are. All right. Well, thank you, Mina. Thank you very much for, for the introduction and for hosting today. 
Uh, President Poser, thanks to you. Uh, Provost Reardon, thank you as well. And thank you to Peter Calico. Um, I wish Peter were here today. He's a good man. And none of this would be possible without Peter. Um, if, you know, Mina, if, um, if you put a gun to my head and said, who is going to win the 2024 race, Joe Biden or Donald Trump? My answer would be shoot. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen an election shaping up the way this one's shaping up. Both parties are on the verge of nominating two of the most unpopular people in America right now to, to represent each party. It is entirely possible that a man who is going to be convicted of a felony is going to get put in the White House by the people of the United States of America. I do not rule out that Donald Trump is going to get convicted somewhere. He's got four shots at it. And he'll still win the election because the American people will put him in the White House in a fair and square election. I don't rule out the possibility that we're going to have a man go into the White House who's going to need a walker. We may have Joe Biden go in there who is going to be 86 years old at the end of his first term. This is uncharted territory our nation is heading down. Two-thirds of the country doesn't want Joe Biden to win. Two-thirds of the country doesn't want Donald Trump to win. So why are they going to be our nominees? Maybe be our nominees. And that's why, and I'm going to close on this note, because I want to keep things brief and moving. Pay attention to no labels this year. I historically traditionally dismiss third parties because there's no evidence, at least in the last 125 years of American politics, of third parties really meaningfully having a shot. But when you have an environment in which both candidates are so disliked by so many people outside the bases of their party, it does create a legitimate center in American politics that potentially could be exploited for the first time in 125 years, successfully exploited. The No Labels Party, or whatever that is, will hold a convention in Dallas this spring after it'll be pretty clear whether or not the nominees are gonna be Biden and Trump, which could throw the world's biggest curveball into American presidential elections if indeed there is room for a viable third, third party candidate. So fasten your seatbelts, it's going to be a wild time. I am not convinced that Donald Trump can win a Republican primary. I do think if it's a one-on-one -on -one race in a Republican primary after New Hampshire, he definitely could win it. But I could see Nikki Haley beating him in a primary as well. It's going to be a fair fight if it gets down to one-on-one. -on -one. I'm not convinced Joe Biden will run. I can see, I give it about 33% odds that Joe Biden will withdraw his candidacy heading into the Democratic Convention. He's one health issue away from having no choice but to do that and under tremendous pressure from the Democrat Party to do that. But he did beat Donald Trump. He's a stubborn man and a proud man, so I give it two to one. He won't do that. But even if it's 33% odds he might, that's significant. So we're heading in, Mina, to the most unpredictable election cycle that I've ever seen, and I think that our country is, is, has had in, in, in the last foreseeable memory for anybody who's involved in politics. Well, I thought I had an assessment, but I have more questions now. Please, let's see. <laughs> let's see what else happens. Uh, the short answer, or maybe short answer is I don't know. That was a short answer. I, um, uh, I was looking at stuff this morning and last night that I found interesting. If I, if I went back 16 years to almost this date, so November of Today's November 9th, yeah. November 8th, uh, 2007. Hillary Clinton was beating Barack Obama in the polls, 47.5. Rudy Giuliani was in first place in the polls, and the Republicans had a 47%. And it was going to be a toss up of what happened. And 30, 35% of people said Barack Obama was too inexperienced to be president. As everybody here knows, Hillary Clinton did a running with Rudy Giuliani for president. So we have to take things with a grain of salt. Then I was thinking about last year when we were here, which was right after the election. But I remember the days leading up to the election, and all the experts, all of them were saying Democrats could lose Arizona in the Senate. They could lose Georgia in the Senate. They could lose Nevada. They could lose New Hampshire. They could lose Pennsylvania. 
Pennsylvania. And some people were even saying we could lose the state of Washington, Patty Murray's race. Democrats won all those races. But you would have gotten really good odds that Democrats would at least lose two or three of them. And that was the day before. That was just a couple of days before. So I, I sort of have come to the conclusion that people like me and people I hang around with know the least about what's going to happen. <laughs> and I, you know, the only other group I can think of like, like us are NFL talent experts. <laughs> because if you have football fans here, you know, last year, Mr. Irrelevant, the last person picked in the NFL draft was Brock Purdy. Yeah. He's the very last pick in the draft. And three weeks ago, they were talking about him being the most valuable player this year in the draft. So that, you know, enormous amount of money is spent on draft experts <coughs> ahead of time. They, they do their mock drafts, and they get paid a lot of money for it. But nobody ever goes back to them and says, well, what did you get wrong? You know? So Brock Purdy, a GM manager, GM, GMs in the National Football League are really good. They're really smart. But they get a lot of stuff wrong, which is why Tom Brady was, what, a fourth or fifth round pick, right? For, yeah. Six round pick. So it's the same thing here. You're asking us a question that's really unknowable because so much, so much changes. Um, the one thing I, I'd say, if I had to say it, one thing is Arizona, not Arizona, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan will be disproportionately important. And I not pay any attention to the to the national numbers right now. I'd just be looking at those states. Well, let me try to unpack this a little to see if we can get some certainty, or at least some, uh, not certainty, but uh, some deeper understanding in this world of uncertainty. Maybe we should almost go with um, candidate by candidate, because there, there, there are really, I think, um, six people that are in the conversation now. May, maybe a seventh, and then we'll see if we bring in no labels too. But why don't we start on the Republican side, since they just had the primary debate. The person who wasn't present who is leading right by a, a majority in the polls, recognizing that not a, a nominating contest hasn't taken place yet. Iowa is in the middle of January. New Hampshire hasn't been set yet, but I believe is going to be January 23rd. Um, and then we'll see South Carolina, Nevada, and Super Tuesday in March. Former President Trump, how is he continuing to lead in the polls when he won't participate in a presidential debate, has not participated in a debate, has been very critical of uh, many people in his party, including the Senate leadership, um, the House when it suits him, um, the Republican National Committee <laughs> at that time. Um, how is, what, what are, what explains former President Trump's standing in the polls and what does that mean looking ahead to uh, to Iowa and New Hampshire? I actually think that's an easy answer. Okay. One, he's an outsider. He's an outsider at a time when a huge part of the Republican Party has deep questions about establishment Republicans and a lot of what I grew up involved in didn't involve with in politics and thinks that Washington is broken and only a strong person can change Washington. The second part of that is, I would argue, his tweets aside, he had a very successful presidency policy-wise. We were at peace. Russia didn't invade Ukraine. There was no war in the Middle East. Inflation was low. Unemployment was low. The southern border was relatively closed. And so for a tremendous number of Republican voters, they look back at the Trump years and say, ah, I'm about to only have it again. And it, it, it amazes me that that is even news to in, inside the Republican Party that's so obvious that Republicans see that in Trump. And just so the audience knows, I did not vote for Donald Trump in 2016. I left my presidential ballot blank. Mm -hmm. I did vote for Donald Trump in 2020 based on what I thought he accomplished in his first term and based on the fact that I, I didn't want Joe Biden to win. I'm a Fox News contributor where I will regularly criticize Donald Trump if he does something wrong, or praise him if he does something right. I'm neutral in the 2024 race, as I look at all the different Republicans out there. But that's why Donald Trump runs so strong in a Republican primary. It's because, in my opinion, he's captured the mood of the modern Republicans, 
and you have a successful first term. Successful term. Yeah. Well, because of Oh, it, it Well, a successful yeah. his his term right. was successful <laughs> from a policy point of view. And and it's interesting, Ari, you would call him a Trump an outsider, even though he was president for four years. <laughs> kind of the ultimate outsider but becomes the ultimate insider. He sure was no insider. Yeah. Okay. I mean it's it's unusual to be able to do that. But that's I think part of his is who he is. Okay. Definitely any comments on the I respectfully I'm disagree with <laughs> <laughs> what Mr. Fletcher said, even though I try to agree with him a lot. Remember, the question is why is he winning the Republican <laughs> primary, not the Democratic primary? He ain't winning that one. No, I, I understand that, but it was just, I, I have a different view of the success of his presidency because I think it was a policy disaster and a political disaster for the Republicans. So I think on both counts, and then from a, a norm standpoint, I think it was bad. But I, I, this is what I'd say we look at polls a lot. Right. I think it's better sometimes to look at election results. Right? So in the election this week, the theory was Democrats were going to lose in Virginia. The Democrats have both houses in Virginia now. So there's a House of Delegates, they have the Senate. In Ohio, we had a vote in August to change the rules in Ohio to make it harder to pass an abortion referendum to go to 60%. And that lost from 37% of the vote. And the referendum this week passed with about 57% of the vote in Ohio. The very Republican state, Kentucky, uh, the governor was reelected there, um, not by a big margin, but by a healthy margin. When I look at what's happened over the last year in a state uh, or city like Jacksonville, Florida, first Democratic mayor in 30 years. If I look at Colorado Springs, Colorado, the first Democratic mayor in 40 years. If I look at special elections in Pennsylvania and New Hampshire, Democrats overperformed and they won. That doesn't mean that's going to be the case next year. But when I'm looking at the difference between polls and election results, it's not that Democrats are winning everywhere. So, you know, they lost in Louisiana governorship. So that, that was a loss, but that's a very tough state. But I see many more victories for Democrats versus where they're standing in the polls. I don't know how that translates to next year, except to repeat what I said before. I wouldn't pay attention to the national level. <laughs> and I think I was right if it gets down to a two-person race on the Republican side, it could be a very different, very different dynamic. So I want to actually pick up, I want to get back to the election results from Tuesday night in a moment. Um, but let me, but I want to actually pick up on this one because it seems to me we're almost looking at two different worlds when we assess the Trump presidency. I mean, Ari, you just said that for Republicans, this is no surprise, right? This, this seems almost intuitive, right? The assessment of right. Trump. But, and I think, I think you wrote this, you've written this before, uh, didn't like the man, like the policies, right? right? Um, I, I think you announced that before the 2020, right? That's been public state. But, um, but Democrats, obviously, as Phil said, have a completely <coughs> different assessment of the Trump presidency. So I don't know that we're going to have any meeting of the minds. Maybe historians will down the road. I, 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 I don't know, but it seems like the, the party divisions on um, on issues ranging from just I think uh, on uh, foreign on taxes, on uh, foreign policy in some areas, on um, investigations that they're just worlds apart. They're the, the two parties seem very kind of calcified right now, and so. Does that mean that 2024 is largely to be a get out the vote election? Which party does? I mean, to some degree, it always is. But that is there less room to move people across party lines? Yeah, I, I think so. I think in this polarized area that is the likelihood. Now, there doesn't have to be a meeting of the minds. There has to be an election, and let the majority prevail. Let the winner win. That's um, the day Joe Biden won. The election was on a Tuesday last year, of course, but it took till Saturday until the networks, including Fox, called the election. And I remember the live on Fox when the election was called saying that as much as I'm a Republican, I'm an American first, and congratulations to President-elect Joe Biden. You don't have to have a meeting in the minds, but if Donald Trump wins, he will be our president, conviction or not. If Joe Biden wins, he will be our president. So you have to trust the people. You have to trust the election. You have to believe the election is fair. And if that's satisfied, 
let the people decide. So it will be polarized, though, and turnout is going to be massive. There has been a change in politics where in the earlier era, in the Bush era, and calmer, more peaceful, more civilized era, in the Obama era, President Obama increased turnout above George Bush. It was a nice jump up from the Bush years and from the Clinton years. Bush increased it over Clinton. Obama increased it over Bush. But in the 2016 Trump-Hillary race, it surged. Turnout surged. Same trend in 2020. And it's because Trump brings out so many new voters to politics who used to think nobody cared about them and their vote didn't matter. They surged for Donald Trump, particularly in rural areas. Trump also brought out huge numbers of people who hate him. And that's why turnout was massive. And I think we'll see a similar thing. But somebody's worked on a lot of campaigns, and someone is currently working on a Senate campaign in Pennsylvania. You've got to appeal to everybody. You've got to be based to turnout, you need massive turnout, but you also do have to target an admittedly smaller number of swing voters. But yeah, you better target them too, because there still is a group of undecided voters who are up for grabs. And a good campaign was after all of them. Bill, any more on? Um, did, well, not so much Democrats turning on the vote. I think that'll come. I, I think there's a bigger issue, um, and I wrote down a couple of quotes, and I'd be curious what Ari but thinks about it, but I, I think it also just goes to, do we think about this the same way we always did, Democrats versus Republicans? The, the first quote, I want to get it right, so I'll just read it, was by John Boehner, who said in 2018, there is no Republican Party. There's a Trump Party. The Republican Party is kind of taking a nap somewhere. <laughs> and then more recently, a senior advisor to Donald Trump, and he was at Boris Epstein. Epstein yes, Epstein. I was with him last weekend. Yeah. <coughs> His quote was, a friend. if you look at the numbers, if you look at the interview, this is the Trump Party. This is the MAGA Party. It is no longer the old school khaki establishment Republican Party. And if those, both those sentiments are right, then we have to think about this in a, a different way. Because it, it it's not like any election before. If, if the Republican Party is not the Republican Party it used to be, then where do some of those people go in 2024? And to offset that, are there other people then that gravitate, if it's the Trump Party, to him that haven't been here before? Right. I think that's the big question. And to put a point on that, here's the trend. And we're living through this time. It started about 20 years ago, but it's increased. The Democrats, which used to be the party of working class, blue collar, more rural Americans, poor, lower income Americans, is increasingly become the power of the party. The voters are making more than $100,000 a year, our college graduates. They've always been the party of postgraduate, but now the Democrats are winning college voters, college educated voters. Republicans always want college educated voters. So you're having a switch of mostly suburban college educated former Republicans who are becoming Democrat, mostly out of revulsion to Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. But it's being met in the other direction too, which is why politics is always dynamic. You've got a huge swath of blue collar workers, lower income workers who are increasingly becoming Republican. Mitt Romney lost the vote of those who made less than $30,000 a year. Good old Mitt Romney. I mean, just the nicest guy, establishment, Polite as could be, a good man. Mitt Romney lost the vote of those making less than $30,000 a year by 28 points. He got his clock cleaned among the new, new, newest people into the workplace. Donald Trump lost it by only eight. A massive 20 point swing among people who don't make a lot of money. So the parties are switching bases. Democrats are increasingly becoming the party of the rich and the educated. Republicans are increasingly becoming the party of working people. Those are the two directions. And if I could just add on that to this, this to try to, because I think that's generally right and directionally, but try to get your arms around it. In this century, 2001, 2003, 2017 tax cuts, $2 trillion went to the top 1%. Democrats in control in 21, 22 did a huge middle class tax cut, and for low income people, a huge tax cut there by expanding and enhancing the child tax credit. So it can't be based just on policies, on pocketbook issues. It has to be something else. There has to be something else driving where people are going. Now, one issue we talked about before.
poor as abortion. That's very powerful with some suburban voters. We saw that this week. But beyond that, there's something going on where we're talking about Democrats have become part of the rich because their policies don't favor the rich. Their policies favor lower income people and middle class people. And Republican policies are a little bit different than that. So I don't have the answer to that, but I just see it in the numbers. We're moving a lot from priorities, politics, to policies. And speaking with both of you, I feel like sometimes that you're both on the Supreme Court. Um, because it actually, it's interesting. Chief Justice Roberts says, right, a lot of times the Supreme Court agrees, but everyone focuses on where they disagree. And we're seeing some interesting areas here, I think, of where both of what you said like to agree on kind of the importance of compromise, consensus building, democracy, um, the rule of law, but very different positions on the candidates. Uh, right, so, and, but we're also talking about political shifts. Yeah, right. Which right. is not a, just it's just what's happening. It's just do you understand why it's happening? And I don't. I, I, I can't say I have a good explanation for it. Well, if we bring it back to the to the candidates, we we talked a, about former President Trump. There were five people on the stage Tuesday evening in Miami. It seems, I think, reasonable to say we we could speak about each one, but former Governor Christie, Senator Scott. Um, businessman Vivek Ramaswamy, it, it, it seems like their their numbers are in the single digits, right? Um, Nikki Haley's numbers actually also are. She's at 8.7, but uh, has had um, has gotten a lot of uh, has, I think uh, built support after each uh, each debate, including Tuesday night. So we have Governor DeSantis of Florida and former Governor South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley. Is either one of them a potential? Um, on a ticket with former President Trump, it seems impossible. Oh, with Donald Trump, I will nothing out. <laughs> I, I mean, if you, if you lose to Donald, if you go after Donald Trump and then you lose and, and you say enough flowery, nice, wonderful things about him, he'll just remember the flowery, nice, wonderful <laughs> that is past Ted Cruz. Um, <laughs> but I, I don't know that the question yet is running me because there's still a presidential election to be had. And the one who fascinates me the most, frankly, is Ron DeSantis. And I say that because in January of 2023, so 11 months ago, Ron DeSantis was running almost even with Donald Trump in the Republican primary. Donald, I mean, Ron DeSantis has a record, especially inside Republican circles, as a man of tremendous character, strength, and accomplishment. But when he said he was going to do something, he took it on and he did it in Florida, mostly open during COVID. He just showed courage in executing his office in a way that really won the admiration of a lot of Republican primary voters. And then, in January, Donald Trump relentlessly attacked Ron DeSantis. And DeSantis sat silent for months and just took the blows, took the blows, and went from almost being even with Trump to now being some 40 points down from Trump. The other reason I think DeSantis has not caught on, despite his admirable record, in my opinion, politics is also part schmaltz. You, you gotta have a little showman in you. You gotta have a little fun on stage. You gotta let people see you and say, I, I don't like that guy. And every time DeSantis communicates, it's with a scowl. It just, it just doesn't look like he's having any fun on that stage talking about this stuff. And I think that's come to heart to hurt him. He's kind of an eat broccoli candidate. <laughs> and you feel that when you watch him at a debate. So I just think it's a fascinating collapse of somebody who had tremendous potential to beat Donald Trump, who just doesn't have the personal style and friendliness and conviviality that a Reagan had, that a Bush had, that a Clinton had. Uh, and that's created the opening up for Nikki Haley. Did she take advantage of it? I think if it's one on one after New Hampshire, as I alluded to, then I think it's a really fair fight. But DeSantis has to drop out. Everybody has to drop out for that fair fight to emerge. Otherwise, Donald Trump certainly has. Any comments on that? Well, let's we should shift to the let's shift to the Democratic uh, side, where there are three official Democratic candidates. I believe, including uh, uh, President Biden, Marianne Williamson, and a congressman from. Uh, Minnesota, right? But at this point in time, uh, New Hampshire is not the Democrats aren't planning to have a primary. There's much about a write in for President Biden. But President Biden has announced re election, and the Democratic Party 
I mean, can I correct that? Yeah. There will be a Democratic primary in New Hampshire. It is a legal, recognized primary. Pete right. right. Phillips is on the ballot. The Democrats and the Democrat National Committee will not right. recognize any delegates who come from that, and Joe Biden won't compete there. Right, though there's a right-in movement, and there will be a question as to whether the delegates ultimately are counted. This is kind of what happened in 2008 with Michigan and Florida, right? Yeah. Uh, because the Democrats have changed the calendar, and uh, right, and, uh, and New Hampshire uh, is moving forward with the first, of the con first right. primary. There will be an election night in New right. Hampshire. No, that's true. There will be. Um, mm -hmm. President the Senator Biden, and former Vice President Biden, in 2020, I believe, left early on election night and moved to South Carolina uh, because New Hampshire didn't go well for him. Right, and then it all turned around in South Carolina. But look, if we focus on the Democrats, the Democratic Party <coughs> is, I almost hesitate to say unified behind President Biden, but I think at least on the surface now, there is the Democratic Party is unified behind the president, but not necessarily enthusiastically. And we discussed over the course of today a little bit uh, at the start of the session um, concerns about the president's age. Um, we'll be 81 in a couple of weeks. Um, we'll be the oldest president. Donald Trump is four years younger than him, <coughs> nevertheless. So uh, both candidates, uh, Trump was the oldest president until, until Biden was elected. Um, questions about energy, um, kind of ability to lead the country for the next four years, fair or not, no matter, it seems like no matter what President Biden does as far as kind of uh, going on international trips, coming back, going on at the uh, runs he takes, no matter what, there are questions about how, what is that, is there a way, I guess Phil, this is probably the fourth question for you, is there a way for the White House to address these concerns beyond kind of governance and moving forward? And then, and then I want to turn to the question of Will there, could there potentially be a shift of the Democrats? Just to that question. Yeah, yeah. I just want to know if there's any way, to start with very simply, is there a way for the Biden campaign, I think that's out, to address these concerns, continuing concerns about the president's age, health, energy, ability to address the you know, I'll start using a skateboard. Around the way, okay. and they do that, or is half backwards. Um, and, and here, here, here's the dynamic I think on the Democratic side right now. Democrats look at Joe Biden and say, during his administration, 14 million jobs have been created. During the Trump administration, almost 2 million jobs are lost. And when you ask people who's been better for the economy, people say Donald Trump. And the Democrats look at those numbers and say, wait a second. Under the Biden administration, 14 million jobs were created, 2 million were lost under Trump. It, it doesn't translate out. Democrats will say people wanted bipartisan legislation. Joe Biden led the way on CHIPS legislation, on other legislation that was strongly bipartisan that's good for the country. Joe Biden did things in investments that were really important for the country. They, they, I'm talking about the party with large right now. They're frustrated that that doesn't translate out. That those, those numbers don't translate out. Um, when it comes to the question, no one can do any bad, how old you are, there's nothing you can do. There's no focus group you can do on that, right? You're, you're the age you are. He's in remarkably good health for somebody 15 years younger, but his age is, is the age. Democrats, I think, remember very clearly the 1980 primary when Ted Kennedy ran against Jimmy Carter, and that didn't turn out so well. So there's some scar tissue there. And they don't think he's done anything that would justify not having him lead the party again, especially since he won uh, in 2020. Remember, Donald Trump has lost the popular vote twice, two elections in a row. So Democrats look at that and say, OK, it's not perfect because of the age issue. But he's a credible candidate with a great record. And once we get into the campaign, it'll, it'll look different. I think that's the way most people in the party might be. I, I want to jump in on one thing. So what, can the, what can the White House do? Yeah. They tried to do one thing, and I want to shine a light on this. You notice that President Biden no longer walks up those majestic grand stairs to the board Air Force One. Where then you climb those stairs, you turn, you wave or salute. They have him going down the lower stairs. Just so everybody knows, once you take those lower stairs into the belly of Air Force One, there's no elevator. 
there's internal stairs that you still have to take to get up to the main level where his office and bedroom and the, every, all the staff are on Air Force One. The only, he still has to climb stairs. The only thing we're doing is hiding it. That is the only reason he's going down those lower stairs. If there was an elevator, he could take the elevator up. I could say, okay, he's 82, that's what they're doing. It's to hide him. It's not 82. Yeah. Correct, he'll be up, about to turn 81. He still takes the lower stairs. <clears throat> when October 7th happened, it happened at 11.30 p.m. The White House staff didn't wait. They waited, they slept through the night, they told them in the morning. During the Afghanistan withdrawal, he said afterwards, he was never briefed, never told that there was an intermediary option to keep in 2,000 or 3,000, a much smaller number of Marines and soldiers in Afghanistan. He said nobody ever briefed him on that. He had to be corrected by General Milley. No fan of Republicans who said he was briefed on that. He didn't remember. These are legitimate issues when considering what the White House has to deal with and how they handle the fact that we have the oldest president, Joe Biden. Maybe if we can expand this a little bit beyond kind of the individuals and, and the policies, which I want to do a lot of follow-ups on those, but let me to stay on the focus of the, the panel topic of the presidential race. Um, the New York Times Seattle College poll from last week, or earlier this week, said that uh, showed that a remarkable number of young voters, 18 to 29 and 30 to 44, um, had an interest in a candidate other than one of the two major parties, particularly Robert Kennedy, Robert Kennedy Jr., who's running as an independent now, right? Was running as a Democrat uh, before. The um, we know, we teach this, all of us in our American politics classes, there are structural reasons why there's a two-party system in the United States. It's very hard for small parties to get uh, to get a seat when you have plurality elections and winner takes. Right? So we don't have proportional representation, we don't have runoff elections for the most part in, uh, in national elections. So, this, in some ways, it seems as though, but we know the third parties, minor parties, have a strong tradition in American politics. They don't win typically, but they can be spoilers. And, or, or maybe that's not a fair word, but they can have an influence. Think about Ralph Nader in 2000, Ross Perot, 1992, 1996, um, the Green Party and, and the Libertarian Party in 2016. Um, what what explains, would you say, particularly among younger voters, especially, I think it was a third of 18 to 29 year olds, um, slightly less than that for uh, 30 to 44, this interest, it's come up in my class, and my students will, we've had this discussion. What's like this interest in Robert Kennedy, who's a young, who's not a young candidate, and um, what role can, the, what, what role might, a minor party or this no labels organization, if they move forward in the spring, have an election. Yeah, um, a couple things. I, I, I mentioned football before about Brock Purdy. My my brother Michael reminds me that in football, the most popular quarterback in any city is the backup quarterback, right? Whoever's playing, if they're not playing well, everybody says we want to get that guy a chance. You're always looking for something different. And so you think you you get that in, in both in both parties right now. I, I'd say uh, I you know worked closely with, with President Biden when he was vice president, and he would often say, "Don't compare me to the Almighty, compare me to the other guy." And when you get in that situation where don't compare me to, to some ideal, some abstract, you could want somebody in this case who's forty five years old, really smart, has a lot of integrity. Could do this, this isn't. Just compare me to who I'm going to be running against. And that, there's a lot of wisdom in that and just a lot of truth in it. So I, I get the urge, isn't there anybody else? I thought I already made a good case before when he was talking about that. I get, the, I get that urge. I don't think that's going to be the reality when we get to next year. I, I just, I, I don't see it. I think the, the, the issues are too strong. I think, I, I think people keep underestimating the abortion issue. And how powerful it is. I watched that in Pennsylvania uh, this week in a place like Allegheny County and the state Supreme Court race in Pennsylvania with the, the 
but the Democrat really won that race based on abortion and he won by a huge margin. And the, the person who won county executive in Allegheny County has been a socialist. That's not an area that usually like socialists is a close race. But she, she won that race. And that to me is those kinds of swing places. And I think that's related more to issues than it was to people. And I think those issues will be present next year. Yeah, I love that line, Joe Biden's line about don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. <coughs> the problem with that line this year is Donald Trump is going to use the same line. <coughs> don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative, Joe Biden. I mean, this is one of these cycles where the Biden team wants to have the only issue be Donald Trump, not himself. Donald Trump people want the only issue to be Joe Biden. The problem is Donald Trump also wants Donald Trump to be the only issue. And that often plays into the Democrats' hands. Um, but this is also why I said earlier that this is going to be the most unpredictable dynamic because you have the two parties seemingly nominating such unpopular people. This does create that opening. You have Cornell West, you have RFK Jr., you have third, no labels. All of this is going to make for this to be such a crazy combustible mix in 2024. It, it's, it really could be five people who have the ability to affect the outcome. You have two people, the main candidates, and then three others who could affect the outcome. Could no labels win? Way too soon to say. But if you have Donald Trump with a conviction, if you have Joe Biden who has a serious health issue, does that really create a legitimate, down the middle, somebody different who can win here? I do not rule that out. Mm -hmm. That would be something new in American politics, yeah. but um, it would be uncharted territory. Anyway. If anyone thinks I've been neglecting topics, I just want you to know that I have on my list here topics to follow up on. Um, the political shift, in the population, policy issues starting with the economy, and uh, also going into uh, trade, foreign policy, um, the Trump indictments, uh, the lack of civility in American politics, the 2023 elections, and um, the whole uh, tumult in chaos in the House over the over leading to an election of the Speaker. So I don't think I'm going to get to all of those in the next few minutes before I turn it over to the audience. But these are other topics that we. I hope, uh, I hope we'll have a chance to explore. But there's a lot to cover here with the Trump campaign, the Biden campaign, the 2024 election with Trump, Biden, the other Republican candidates that have been on the debate stage, and questions about kind of polls, policies, and prospects a year from now. Let me go back to the election results on Tuesday night, because we've talked about these in other settings, but we haven't today. Both of you have brought up the issue with abortion, candidates who won in races, what the Virginia legislat uh, legislative races mean, what the, uh, referend the initiative in Ohio, trying to pass by a solid majority, looking at the um, uh, governor's race in Kentucky. How much can we draw? This scene, Tuesday night, I mean, if we kind of take the general message that came through, it was a, it was a good night for the Democrats nationally, overall with the uh, in Ohio and in Kentucky. Um, we can get into local races, but I think for today's purposes, we'll kind of, for right now, focus on the national. Um, what, are the, what, what can we draw from, the, from Tuesday night's results as we look into the campaign going into 2024, recognizing that November is still right, a year away? Yeah. My view is this Tuesday night didn't really show us anything that's of value to 2024. Other than to say we're a close, close of country. Elections are close. There just was no overarching, discernible movement one way or another. You know, in the case of Kentucky, Andy Bashir, the Democratic incumbent who won re-election, he's the nation's most popular governor. And so the notion that he was going to lose, I think, was far-fetched all along. So the incumbents stay pat. The only turnover in the 2023 cycle was Louisiana, where the Democrat governor was defeated, and you had a Republican governor. So net, Republicans gained one governorship in 2023. Well, I'll take one, but it's not a it's not a trend. And in the local races, of course, you all know what happened in Suffolk County here. It's a massive populated county uh, compared to a lot of these other places where there were change. So that was a good one for Republicans. There are other places, Ohio abortion referendum. I do think the that abortion as a 
overarching issue since Roe v. Wade is playing to the Democrats' political benefit. And that's something Republicans are going to have to wrestle with. It's a part of the reason why Republicans have been losing college-educated suburban women. College-educated suburban women are increasingly becoming Democrats. Uh, abortion's a big part of that. But that's, that's the, the only other big trend I see heading into 24, frankly, is Joe Biden's age. That is the other fundamental big issue that particularly for young voters, young voters, Democrats have to turn out 18 to 29 year olds in huge numbers. And a lot of 18 to 29 year olds so really? And that's gonna hurt their turnout. So those are the big Uber issues of 23 trending into 24. Abortion favors the Democrats. Joe Biden's age favors Republicans. The rest of it, let 2024 play out. Um, you know, I was talking to my niece about this, my niece Emma, about age, and, and uh, President Biden, and I said, how much does it bother you? And she said, it, it's not the best, but I would definitely vote for it. It's not gonna, I'm gonna vote, and he's the person I would vote for. And I think that's gonna be a lot of younger people next year. It's a factor. But when they're looking at the alternative, it's, it's a little bit different. The, the things I'd say, is I would try to save time for everybody here to, to save you time, okay? Don't spend a lot of time reading about polls right now, okay? There's a lot of stuff you can read. There's a lot of stuff you can do. There's a lot of podcasts you can listen to. Spend your time on that instead of obsessing about a poll in November before the election, okay? Even when you get to, like, September, start paying a little attention, but it can change a lot. It's not going to tell you a lot. If it's a Biden-Trump election, I don't really have any question that Joe Biden would win the popular vote again. We've had this tested, field tested twice. Both times, Donald Trump lost by that. But I don't pay attention. It's what I said before, and what I urge you to do. I don't pay attention to the national numbers. Look closely at what's going on in places. In Wisconsin, there was a big judicial election earlier this year. The Democrat who was associated with abortion rights and other issues won overwhelmingly in Wisconsin. Look at what's happening in Michigan. The Republican Party is at war with itself. It makes what happened on the House floor with the speakership fight look like patty cake. That's what's happening for the people who have to turn out their voters in, in Michigan. Look what's happening in Pennsylvania. Look at the, the elections this week. Look at the special election. Look where the popularity of the governor is. That's the stuff that's going to matter. If there's a third party candidate, Joe Biden's going to win New York, he's going to win California, he's going to win Illinois, and, and, and Donald Trump will win Texas, he's the, he's the candidate, he'll win Arkansas, he'll win Mississippi, he'll win Michigan. What are the states that matter? And it really comes down to Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and you could throw in New Hampshire and Nevada into that. Yeah. It's Georgia. Georgia. Yeah, but, it, but if Joe Biden just won those five, and he lost Georgia, he'd still be president by electoral college. So that that's I wish it weren't the case. I, I wish we could have more competitive you know places to go. But that, that's what it is. Everything else to me is just normal. Focus on the candidates and the issues. I would hope so. <laughs> and, and really, you know, get more so it's less on the horse race and more on the implications of policy. Because we have big issues that the, the decisions we have to make about Ukraine are really important policy questions about the United States' role in the world. The decisions we make about climate change, it's not a myth, it's not abstract, it's happening. Folks read the this, this studies this week about, uh, about ice, um, ice sheets and what's happening to them. That really matters. And, and so we have a lot of issues like that. Social Security, there are easy ways to shore up the system. Getting to those issues really matters. So I wish there was less on the political side, the horse race side, and more on really important policy issues. I'm going to open it up in just a, a moment. I pull up a microphone, and we'll try to, you know, we'll try to, uh, we have several classes here, so we're going to try to do student questions first. Let me just conclude with one question that deals with structure and not individuals. There was a, a as we know, there was a, a, there were several issues in 2020 after the election was called with acceptance of the legitimacy of the election results. And this continues to be an issue today. It came up in the um, uh, the uh, race for the Speaker of the House just a couple of weeks ago. 
do both of you have concerns about challenges to election results in 2024? Now, Congress did pass a revision last November after the midterms to try to clarify that the vice president cannot um, certify the vote, but cannot change, um, cannot uh, uh, recall the state votes, which had been suggested for Vice President Pence uh, in 2021, and he didn't do that. Do you have concerns, and do you see, is there something that could be done to address those concerns in advance of election day, 2024? I'll always have concerns. Uh, having survived Bush v. Gore in 2000, where we won Florida by 364 votes. Yeah, close elections give the other side a legitimate reason to say, wait a minute, this went wrong, that went wrong. And when you have tens of millions of ballots counted, I assure you, some of them are wrong. And so the best thing is for either candidate to win by a sizable majority. This is what assures we don't have too many of these fights, because even as you were talking about in, in North Castle, the town supervisor race has been settled by one vote. Well, if you're on the other side of that one vote, I can guarantee you, you're going to find an absentee ballot that shouldn't count. Right? Somebody's going to have circled something wrong. And so you can make a fight out of a close election. Um, I don't think systemically there is anything wrong with America's democracy in our systems. I do think that in the case of COVID and how we went to extraordinary emergency steps during COVID, there was a tilt, particularly in where uh, ballot boxes, once you drop your ballots off, were placed. They were placed predominantly in Democratic voting areas. They were not placed fairly 50-50 across America. And that's a problem. But I have faith in our institutions. I have faith in the elections. And close elections will always bring out the other side saying somebody did something wrong. Stacey Abrams, of course, did that when she lost in Georgia. Democrats backed her up and said the Georgia election was stolen, their words. And I will always remember 2004, Ohio was very close between Bush and John Kerry, and a number of House Democrats objected to the votes in Ohio and tried to overthrow the election. They were defeated, they wasn't allowed their, they weren't, didn't have sufficient votes to challenge Ohio, but they tried, a small number of them. So I'm for big election wins, not small. Exactly. Okay. I think um, when it comes to this question about democracy and health elections, we don't have a cold, we have pneumonia. And the best manifestation of that is what happened on January 6th. It's never happened before. I, I hate to keep going back to sports analogies, but we just had a World Series. It wasn't between the Phillies and the Astros. They lost in their championship series. They didn't contest the results. They lost, and then we had a World Series of the teams that won. In American politics, that's always how it's been. Until the aberrational and, and, and abnormal events between Election Day in 2020 and January 6th, which resulted in an armed insurrection against the United States. And, and for, this is not a partisan statement. I'd encourage everybody to read Liz Cheney's comments on this. Go, Liz Cheney has talked a lot about this, about the threat. Look at one of the most conservative judges in the country, Judge Michael Ludwig, and the clear and present danger to American democracy. His, you know, there's a phrase, your hair is on fire. He, he's been a Republican his whole life. He's been the idol of scores of, of Republican lawyers and other judges. Ted Cruz clerk for him. He thinks we're just on the precipice to fall. And so if everybody doesn't come together and say the results are the results, and you can't just make up stuff. Anybody can make up stuff. You can't make up stuff. Our democracy won't survive the way we know it. So I, I'm very concerned on, on this question. I think what they did on the Electoral Count Act is important, but I think it goes beyond that. And, I, and thankfully, there are a good number of Republicans, including Mitt Romney and, and maybe led by Mitt Romney and Liz Cheney, who understand the danger and are talking about it. But I think that's a civic responsibility for everybody. Not a partisan issue, it's just the health of our democracy. Thank you both. Let's open this up for questions. Um, students, if you want to raise your hand, we're going to... Oh, we're going to laugh. Is that it? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, let's have some... Uh, let's try to get students over here. If you could just state your name and your major, that would be great. Okay, good. Read the right now, please. <laughs> 
It's good to have you all here. Um, Michael Richardson, I'm a senior journalism major here at the school. And you, all, you all are terrific. Here's my question. How much of a policy-focused election do you see the 2024 race ultimately need? I, I think it's, uh, for a lot of the reasons Ari said, I said today, I think it's going to be less on policy, more on personalities and other intangibles. I think there'll be an attempt to make it about, you know, some big policy questions. But I, I think it's going to end up being different than that. But I, with the exception of abortion, I think I think abortion will be a driving issue. Yeah, I see room for a lot of other policies. Uh, I think Republicans are going to hammer the issue about an open border, and Republicans are going to hammer the issue of how weak America is perceived abroad. I think they're going to hammer inflation. There are a lot of issues Republicans policy issues Republicans are going to use against Joe Biden. Um, if it's Donald Trump, of course, he just has a, a volume on what he says and a way of saying things that kind of transcends policy. Uh, he, he tends to make it a little more personal. So, but he's still going to focus on those same issues. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Chris Casella. I'm a senior as well. Uh, I was just at the uh, Suffolk County uh, Republican uh, uh, headquarters this Tuesday, uh, reporting for WRHU, uh, and one thing that I noticed when I, in my time there was, in terms of all the uh, political figures we interviewed, in terms of all of the major speakers that we had, uh, uh, Trump was not on the list of anyone, and like we had the. Uh, Lee Zeldin there, who's probably the maybe the biggest name in Long Island politics right now, major Republican candidate for governor, and never once mentioned in his speech Donald Trump. None of the people mentioned Donald Trump. And I feel like we keep seeing a lot of these uh, Trump candidates losing in the polls, because on Long Island, Republicans this Tuesday had massive victories, but the uh, Kentucky governor uh, election, Daniel, uh, Daniel, Daniel Cameron, endorsed by Trump, he lost. Carrie Lake, in 2022, endorsed by Trump, she lost. Uh, and even now, uh, after the uh, the House, uh, the, the House speakership, we we saw uh, Mike Johnson uh, receive the uh, receive the speakership. He what well, he's now also a major Trump supporter. So my question is, it seems that the Republican Party at least in some areas, is still very unsure as to whether or not they want Trump to be their guy. And and because we keep seeing time and again that Trump candidates are losing. Right. So okay. are is that going to be a big player in this coming election? You, I think your premise is a hundred percent right. And welcome to the Northeast. <laughs> and that's what a Republican in the Northeast should do. Now, I would also point out in the Kentucky governor's race, Andy Bashir, the popular Democrat, one of the reasons he's popular is because he criticized Joe Biden. And so politics is local in that sense. And in a blue state like New York, the only reason you can have these red pockets is because it's not MAGA ish. This is not a MAGA state for Republicans. The rest of America, Donald Trump's proving, so far at least, that that's the movement of the Republican Party. But as I point out, in the Mississippi governor's race, where a guy named Brandon, Brandon Presley ran and lost by five percentage points to the incumbent Republican governor of Mississippi. And if you're going to run, by the way, as a Democrat in Mississippi, he had the best name possible. Brandon, as in let's go Brandon. And he's Elvis's cousin, Brandon Presley. And he still lost. But he would not embrace Joe Biden running as a Democrat in Mississippi. So it's the same dynamic. Republicans here don't embrace Trump. A Democrat in Mississippi who tried to become the governor would never embrace Joe Biden. I draw no lessons from that other than regionality. Thank you. I, I think it's a really interesting question. I, I just want to, because you touch on this indirectly, think about what happened this year, through the course of this year, in the House of Representatives for Speaker. There have been more votes for Speaker this year than the past 40 years combined. This was always a routine function. And the reason there have been more votes this year is because of the fissures in the Republican Party. You're touching on it when you see out here. 
but it becomes really hard. It becomes really hard when people don't accept defeat. So when, when Steve Scalise won, that should have been it. He should have been on the floor and the next speaker. He said people who lost refused to do that. They refused to accept defeat. And the same thing happened with Tom Evans. And you start going through people, and they, they can't put together the votes because people won't accept the result. But it shows the intense feelings. It's not even so much a Republican-Democratic fight. Now, sometimes the intent, most intensity is between the Republican Party. And so I think you probably picked up some of that the other night, and it's already said some of that to each other. Thank you, both. I see five students in line here. We're going to get, oh, no, is there more? All right, I think we'll be close. I'll be sitting on there yeah. after Brian. Let's see, Brian. Um, uh, all right. Another three after me. Three? Okay. Eight questions. We're cutting it off with these eight students. Go ahead, Charlotte. My name is Charlotte LaMagna, and I'm a sophomore public policy folks, um, service major. <clears throat> and my question is, is, do you think that there is still space in the Democratic Party for blue collar Democrats, or has the party as a whole Abandon that base, and if so, why have they moved away from that base? Uh, they have not abandoned the base. Yes, there is space, and you can see that in the in the uh, strikes in Michigan with President Biden going out. Democratic Party lined up with the workers. Yes, there's space. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, hi again, I'm Josh, a poli sci major, and last night in the debate, we I saw I noticed from the moderation that they were very interested in day one immediate action of how the candidates would approach um, presidency, and I just want to ask, what do you think would be a more effective strategy to focus on that day one immediate action that kind of just all the promises, or more of a long term plan throughout the term throughout the president's term and maybe going into second term? Yeah, I think Bill and I were both there on day one. <laughs> and they want is kind of a helpful way to frame things. What's your most important priority? What would you do on day one? The, the truth is that everything is long term. Presidents don't have that kind of unilateral power on day one to change everything. I mean, especially if you need legislation, that's going to be day 1000. Um, but I, I get the question. I don't take it literally, I take it seriously. What are your priorities? What would you do on day one? But it's not a literal. Uh, hi, my name is Lorraine. I'm currently a junior. So my question is, I know that we've already stated that policy is not really what we're focusing on, but what I'm noticing is a trend of younger voters don't really care much about political lines, more so the issues that we're focusing on. And I know that uh, we've already touched on the issue of abortion, but outside of the issue of abortion, what do you think uh, policy-wise is going to be the most pressing thing for younger voters in this coming election? <laughs> Go to more existential issues. So uh, climate change. I think it's a huge issue that's the world people get grow up in. I think technology and AI is something that young learners are really good. They're gonna understand it more, but I think they're gonna to have to grapple with it more. So I think that'll be I think that'll be a front and center issue. Thank you so much. Uh, you can go with me. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll just, I think you have to layer into that too. And I think Bill's right, especially for younger Democratic voters, the climate is a serious issue and it's top of mind. But I think you also have to layer in getting a job, getting a good economy, getting a start in life. Um, there have been generations of kids who graduated from college when the economy wasn't creating jobs, and it was miserable. And so that is always going to be, I think, front of mind. When things are good, you take it for granted. When things are bad, you miss it. So I think that's going to be a, a huge issue always. Thank you both so much. Well, I'm Danny, I'm a senior. I think I've asked you both questions before. I wanted to ask about the Trump campaign because it's really interesting. He's running essentially as an incumbent, even though he's not an incumbent, and he doesn't officially have the RNC behind him yet. What have you noticed that he's doing differently this time around that's clearly working due to his poll lead in the polls and the fact that he's not attending debates and he's still a perennial front runner? Yeah, he reminds me a lot of Grover Cleveland, and I remember it well. <laughs> He was the last incumbent who wasn't an incumbent who ran as an incumbent and took his presidency back. Um, and just for trivia and fun, so Joe Biden is the 45th president, but we've had 44 presidents because Grover Cleveland, Donald Trump's trying to pull a Grover Cleveland. Cleveland won, he was defeated, he came back and defeated the guy who beat him, which is what Trump's trying to do to Biden. Um, what Trump's doing, what was staying away? By not debating. Donald Trump 
is securing, giving himself the best chance to win the primary. By hammering Ron DeSantis when DeSantis didn't fire back. Really smart of Donald Trump. Um, the way I look at the presidential, the Republican primary, it's like your NCAA bracket. You know, on one side of the basketball bracket, it already says Donald Trump is going to the Final Four. There's no <laughs> other teams he has to play. He's in the Final Four. He's placed in the Final Four in the beginning of the bracket. But on the other side of the bracket, you've got all these other Republicans. You know, Doug Burgum, Asa Hutchinson, Chris Christie, name it. They're trying to keep moving up the bracket to see who the one is who gets to be in the jack game against Donald Trump. That's smart of Trump, politically smart of Trump. What I don't like about it is I think it gives Joe Biden an excuse to miss the debates next fall. Because if I'm Biden, first of all, I think Biden's White House does not want him on stage for two hours on script. And then if you're Joe Biden, what you'll say on principle is, well, Donald Trump didn't debate. And Donald Trump's an election denier and a threat to democracy. I'm not going to share the stage with him. Why would I elevate him? He did the same thing, so you can't say it's wrong. So I think Trump's helping himself short term, but giving Biden an excuse longer term. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, I think it's interesting you brought up uh, Grove of Cleveland uh, because it wasn't in 1888. Until 2000, 1880, it was the last time there was a conflict between the popular vote and the electoral college vote, and you were there for 2000. <laughs> I knew it happened in 1876. Yeah, no, 1888 was when Benjamin Harrison won. And yeah. then Cleveland came back, so he was both, and he ran three times. So I was 15 yeah. years old. <laughs> <laughs> I remember going on Twitter and not knowing how to spell Grover. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, hi, my name is Brian. I'm a political science major. Um, it's kind of not all talk, but uh, Governor Gavin Newsom, he's been raising a lot of money recently, and he went to China recently to talk about climate change stuff, and while he was there, he tackled a small child at that video. Um, so if Joe Biden doesn't run or something happens to him, do you think it's possible that he might jump in, or do you think it's going to have to be another Democrat? Or yeah, another Democrat other than yeah. Joe Biden? I, 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 I think Joe Biden is going to run. There's no education he's not. If he didn't, I think a lot of people would, would jump in. I mean, a lot of people are saying, Look, if he doesn't run in Richmond, Gretchen Whitmer ran, she would Michigan, she would Wisconsin, she would Pennsylvania. She just has to pick up one or two others and she's done. People will make a case for some other other folks, like Andy Bashir in Kentucky given his his race. But I think he probably would get in, but who knows? You know, I think you can't get a good chance to get a nomination. I, I just, it's just impossible. I mean I can make up an answer, but I have no idea. Well, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for not making an answer. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm, I'm Michael, I'm a junior here. Um, so it's a little bit off, off topic, but but um, if we do have a a Republican win the next election, uh, how do you think that that would affect uh, Project? 2025. Depends who the Republican is. I think if Nikki Haley mm -hmm. wins in 2024, we're going to go back to a typical era of politics mm -hmm. where if she's doing well and the economy's good, it'll give momentum to the Republicans and they might have a good interim couple of years. If it's Donald Trump, I suspect the same pattern will happen where Trump brings out so many people and that's why he won in 2024. But then Democrats come roaring back in 25 and 26. Um, I think it's really interesting um, when we try to project out where things are going to be. And in, I think if you ask most pundits right now, and this, this would be an extraordinary situation if uh, Donald Trump won, but Democrats won the House. Oh, uh, and Republicans won the Senate. Right. Yeah. That that's not what happens in elections. It right. just, just doesn't go that way. But I think most pundits would say right now, Democrats are in position to get back the House, and Republicans are in position to get back the Senate, and the president sees a toss-up. Right. Right. Thank you. Hello. My question is: 
How do you feel that the polarization of the country would change if former President Trump and President Biden treat each other differently on a public stage? <laughs> Can you just tell us what you mean by differently? What are you <laughs> More civil. More be okay, in a better word. Yeah. Better word, thank you. That's why you're there and I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent question. Yeah, I think it's more likely that Elvis is going to come alive, the <laughs> are going to come walking on the stage, but it's not happening. It's just not who these guys are. Um, look, when George Bush hugged Michelle Obama, I thought that sent a great signal about our country. It was a shame it had to take place at a funeral, where people see that, for people who are out of office, because maybe we're at a stage now where you can only do that if you're out of office. Because when Chris Christie hugged Barack Obama, it was used against Chris Christie when Christie ran. Uh, but I'm old school like that. I prefer my politics civil. So I'm afraid to say, if they take the stage, they're coming out <laughs> the same way they are right now. Thank you. Thank you. That's OK. Thank you. We're at Hi, my name is Amelia. I'm a communications major here uh, at the comm school. Um, so you touched upon uh, RFK Jr. and third parties a little bit at the beginning of this lecture, and it reminded me of the 1912 presidential election. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, where Teddy Roosevelt switched from being a Republican into the Progressive Party, thus maybe taking away votes from the Republicans. Can you see something similar happening if RFK Jr. or any third party candidate um, increases in popularity? I'm going to stick with that same answer. I don't know. <laughs> it's not. It's not knowable. I don't think a third party candidate will be a significant factor uh, based on the last 50 years in 2024. But it's but it's possible. I think in some ways um, Republicans are more worried about Kennedy now running in the way he's running that he can take away votes from from Trump more than the damage he'll do it again. We have to look at it state by state. So if you can show me that he's really popular in a key state, that might make a difference. Thank you. So we're actually, we have about five minutes left. I think rather than open it up, because I know it's terrible when people line up and they can't ask, let me just follow up on two of the questions that I think we, we, had, uh, we would have done follow-ups on. Um, the question about if Biden doesn't run and if, if Governor Newsom would run, or who else would enter the way? So, for you, um, obviously, Vice President Harris would be the logical choice. Um, but there have been concerns expressed with the Democratic Party about uh, if, by, if President Biden didn't run, if like, would Vice President Harris and then the same be able to unify the Democratic Party? What are your thoughts on the kind of intra party dynamics? Right? I mean, this is a tough question, right? But what, um, how does the Democratic Party navigate? But, uh, Mina keeps trying to get me to answer hypotheticals. <laughs> <laughs> that I, I don't are on camera. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't see a lot of, um, I, I don't see a lot of value in today because I don't know how to evaluate the hypothetical. If, under yours, if, if you decide not to run, I think it's going to be, you know, five, six, seven people get in. And then you, you see who can start putting together votes really quickly and how that dynamic plays out. But there's so many variables that I think at this point it's just not productive to, to do it. It's too much guesswork. Yeah. May, I, may I play on that one? <laughs> uh, if Joe Biden drops out, my bet is he'll do it right before the convention. I don't see him doing it. In January, February, March, just too much of a shock to the system. And I think he would want to engineer it so it went to his vice president. And the best way to engineer that would be drop out right before the convention, and then you basically challenge the Democrat superdelegates at the convention to say, are you going to vote against the sitting vice president? Though I don't see it going to primary states to settle. I think it becomes a power move inside the Democratic National Committee. And that will favor Kamala Harris. Is it a fair assessment to say that this, if the Democratic nomination becomes open, this will be a, a difficult situation for Democrats to resolve? I'm going to give you a, um, because these are hypotheticals, I think it'll be a very healthy situation 
I think it would be a very good, good situation for that to happen. It would be an area of, of use. I think that the one thing on the, that I'm curious about, what our, what our agent said, is I just watched um, how hard it was for Mike Pence to gain traction as a presidential candidate. And I don't know if we reached a point now where whether it's a sitting vice president, a former vice president, less deference is given. I, I just don't know. Um, yes. Well, all right. I'll, I'll let her. Can you come up here, though? Okay. It has to be quick, though. Okay. I was going to ask flexibility and technology, and I'll defer to you. Professor X here. Thank you to my students for asking such good questions. Um, I'm just wondering if both of you could maybe comment on your ideas for VP. Thoughts about who the VP might be? <laughs> well, I think it's going to be Kamala Harris. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sort of going out on a letter, but I kind of think that's where it's headed. Could you possibly put the ball on the hoop or tell them just to tip it in? Any easier than that? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, for the, <laughs> on the Republican side, I mean, it's come, let's let's see who's got the most flowery suck up. I love you. You're the best. I mean, everything you've always done, I've always loved you. Your, your lobbies, your marble counters, it's always been the best. And it's going to be the person who does that to Donald Trump. It, it is not going to be a person who elector. There's no electorally helping him. He is either going to win or lose on his own. The vice president will not deliver anything. Um, but I do think he's going to look for somebody who is going to be that type of loyalist person. And so All right, let me, I can squeeze in. Thank you. That's a good question. Let me conclude with a question about civility and technology, because this question came up in uh, students here at Trump throughout the day, the need for more civility in politics. We've also talked a lot about technology and social media, and it seems to me that there's there's a link here. I'm not sure how we address it, but social media has fostered this ability to speak quickly, to add to comment based on emotion, and has contributed to not this whole cause for the decline of civility. How can we make how how can we improve the state of politics? One minute each. Time. <laughs> uh, we talked about this before. I, Fundamentally, I think the incentives and disincentives are misaligned right now. So, um, being rude, not being civil, is a money maker. People can make money all different ways doing it. And there are very few incentives in the system now to be sort of traditional, to be civil, to work things out, to compromise. So, we have to figure out how to change. And it's not going to be regulation, but how do you, how do you change that? How do you change those incentives? I don't say this is a partisan matter. It's just a, it just was my experience last year. Last October, I drove my, last September, I drove my daughter's car from New Mexico to Washington, D.C. And I didn't have any books on tape or anything like that. And I just put on AM stations and I put it on scan. And almost the entire way, it was talk radio. And it was talk radio talking about the Biden crime family or this or that. But all, for two days, and you'd say, well, what are you doing, experiment on yourself? <laughs> I was really interested in what, what people hear. There's no counter to that, really, on the Democratic side. Democrats have been trying to figure it out for a long time. They'll never figure it out. But the, there's, the, those radio stations are money makers. They're, they're, they're not, they're, they're, these are not not-for-profit things. And for members of Congress who want to advance, being harsh, being rude, being out there pushing the envelope brings attention. So, and that's why a relatively small number of people get so much attention. You should have put it on the FM dial. <laughs> <laughs> you have nothing but country music. <laughs> um, I, I spent last Monday with my old boss. I was in Dallas, and I see him about once a year. And I said, I just spent an hour smoothing with him. And this is something we've talked about at length, actually. And his answer, if you asked him, would be the way we would restore civility in Washington through leadership. One day, we will elect a president who, when he says, I will run as a unifier, they mean it. And they'll run down the center and try to govern from the center, they'll try to bring people together. Will they be successful? I don't know, because of the polarization that Phil has put his finger on. But it won't happen until you have a leader, a president, who believes so deeply in it 
that they tried to change Washington. And that's why we have presidents. Presidents are change agents. So it's not going to happen in the 24 cycle with Biden and Trump on the ballot. We'll have a continuation of this unfortunate polarization that's been taking place in 16. But nations go in phases. It's like you know, when I was a little kid and I was scared about something, my mother would say, you're going through a phase that we're out of it. Nations go through phases that we grow out of it too. It'll be leadership. Our president will one day get elected. We're all going to say, where have you been? I've been waiting for that. On that note, please join me in thanking both of our speakers.